I am going to be reading chapter 8 of the Geography of You and Me. On Sunday, Owen and his father took the subway down to Times Square. A day out to celebrate surviving your first week of school, Dad said cheerfully as they emerged from below ground, finding themselves immediately surrounded by a sea of tourists, their face all hidden by maps or cameras. Surviving being the operative word there, Owen said under his breath, though it was apparently still loud enough to make Dad roll his eyes. It can't be that bad, he said, tilting his head back to take in the blinking signs all around them. There were huge television screens and tickers with scrolling stock quotes, billboards and advertisements all lit up so that even in the middle of the day, the whole strange electric landscape gave off a whitish glare. Actually, it is, Owen said looking without looking at him. A crowd of tourists brushed past, bumping into him, and he was shoved forward a step. You've got to stop acting like such a country mouse, Dad said, clapping him on the back. You're a New Yorker now. Hardly, Owen said quietly. But if Dad heard him this time, he didn't say anything. Instead, he looked left and then right before stepping forward. This way, he said, starting to walk down Broadway with all the confidence, all the confidence of a man headed in the right direction. Where are we going? Wherever, he said, his voice bright. We're seeing the sights, taking it all in, enjoying the city, getting to know the place, making the best of it. They paused at an intersection to let a red tour bus pass, and Owen jabbed a thumb at it. You should really be working for them. I might just get the chance, Dad said, but to Owen's relief, he was smiling. Ever since the night the power came back, he'd gone about his superintendent duties with a quiet dodge, dodgedness that was unlike him. Even when he'd been unemployed for all those months, he still started each morning by proclaiming that this might be the day, the one where everything turned around. He was a believer in fresh starts and second chances, and even in the throes of his grief this summer, a fog of sadness so thick he couldn't seem to see around it, he'd still been heartened by the idea of a new job. He'd wanted to get back to work. It didn't matter whether it was building houses or fixing clogged drains, work had always been a tonic. But this week, he had, it had seemed like it was just another burden. It wasn't hard to guess what had happened. Owen had no doubt that Sam Coleman had been in touch, and he, he hated to think of that foxy little man yelling at his father, warning him in the same way he'd warn Owen. They'd managed to get the water pumps working that night. The two of them crouched on the floor of the utilities room until late, his father holding a flashlight while Owen worked the wrench with gritted teeth, following instructions as best he could. But he knew enough to know that wouldn't be the end of it. And watching his father now, his face alight with the reflected glow of the billboards all around them, he understood not everything would be so easily fixable. What should we do first, Dad asked as the light turned green and they were swept across the street by a tide of people. Owen shrugged. Whatever you want. Oh, come on, he said, looking around. We could go see a show? Um, or a play? Owen made a face. Fine, Dad said with an exaggerated groan. Then you pick something. He was about to refuse. He was about to point out that this whole excursion wasn't his idea. He was about to suggest simply going home. But they were approaching an enormous gift shop. The whole window filmed with, filled with green foam crowns shaped like the Statue of Liberty, big apple pens and pencils and paperweights, Yankees jerseys and I Heart New York shirts like the ones he grumbled about to Lucy. Let's take this place out, he said, veering to the right, and though Dad gave him a mystified look, he followed without comment. Inside the shop was crowded, and while Dad wandered over to check out the display of old subway tokens, Owen slipped by a family trying on matching t-shirts and wove his way to the enormous rack of postcards. Every day this week, he'd look for Lucy. Every day, he thought about knocking on the door of her apartment. At first, because he wanted to apologize for leaving the roof that morning, and then later, simply because he was anxious to see her again. But something kept stopping him. He couldn't let go of the worry that the night hadn't meant the same thing for her. For him, it had been a kind of oasis, not just the elevator and not just the roof, 
but the simple fact of being with her. And as soon as he'd seen the gift shop, he was right back there again, lying on the floor of her kitchen and talking about faraway places. As he slipped through the postcards, he came around one that where a series of pink bright letters spelled out the words, wish you were here, in a banner across the Manhattan skyline. He felt a strange electricity go through him at the sight of it. They'd laughed together at the slogan that night, at the half-heartedness of the words. But standing there, he couldn't remember why he, why he found them so ridiculous only days ago. Wish you were here, he thought, closing his eyes for a moment. When he opened them again, there was a clerk standing in front of him, an older man with unruly sideburns and a bored expression. Can I help you, he asked, not sounding particularly excited about the prospect. I'll take this, Owen said, surprising even himself. And can I get a stamp too? From across a sea of miniature yellow cabs and red apples, he could see his father wandering back in his direction. Before he could think better of it, he reached for a pen shaped like in the Empire State Building and scrawled a few words across the back of the postcard, then grabbed the stamp and slid a couple dollars across the counter and thanked the clerk. Find anything, Dad asked as he joined him at the counter, but Owen only shook his head. The stuff's for tourists, he said with a shrug. We live here. Though he tried to hide it, Owen could see the grin that crept onto his dad's face, which remained there all the way out of the shop and into the street. They turned back down Broadway, moving toward the lights like a couple of moths. But just before the next intersection, Owen hesitated, letting dad, who didn't even seem to notice, move on without him. There was a blue mailbox beside a lamp post near the edge of the sidewalk. And before he could think better of it, he stepped over to it, opened the chute, and let the postcard go sailing away from him. Later, they took the subway back home, tired and sunburned. As they walked the last few blocks, Owen noticed for the first time an edge of coolness in the air, an early hint of a shifting season. His first thought of was home. Not so much the house in Pennsylvania as his mother. And his second, of course, was to recall that it didn't exist anymore, at least not the way he remembered it. Beside him, Dad seemed lost in the thought too. But when Owen looked over, he offered a smile. Not a bad day, huh, he said. Maybe we should go do something tonight too, go see a musical or something. He laughed at the expression on Owen's face. I'm only kidding, maybe just a movie, or hey, what about the planetarium? That's probably more up your alley. As they walked up to the revolving doors, Owen was momentarily lost for words. He didn't know whether to be cautious or hopeful. Every night since they'd been here, Dad had simply disappeared into his room after dinner. He'd always been a morning person, so going to bed early wasn't unusual. But ever since the accident, it seemed that all he did was sleep, like it was some sort of drug and he couldn't get enough of it. All this week, it had been even worse, worn down as he was by worn down as he was by the lingering effects of the heat exhaustion, and Owen had assumed tonight would be no different. But now it seemed possible he was starting to wake up again. As they swung through the doors, Dad first, followed by Owen in the next compartment, he read it his, his response. That sounds great, he would say, as they spilled out onto the other side. I'd really like that. But when he stepped out of the carousel, and into the lobby, he stumbled straight into Dad, who was standing stock still in front of the doors. Owen looked around him to see the broad back of Sam Coleman, who was leaning on the desk and talking to a man in a blue shirt with a cap that read, EMK Plumbing. For a moment, Owen considered bolting. He thought about shoving his father through the doorway to the mailroom and straight downstairs, where they could order a pizza and turn on a movie and act like none of it happened. The accident, or the move, or the blackout, the trip to Coney Island, and the sad and weary aftermath. But instead, he simply watched as Dad squared his shoulders and lifted his chin. Everything okay there, Sam? He called out, and both men turned in their direction. Sam smiled, a smile that felt like its opposite, and the plumber lowered his clipboard. That him? he asked, and Sam nodded, stepping forward. Hey there, Buckleys, he said, all friendliness and teeth. How's it going? 
Fine, Dad said shortly. What's happening? Sam's eyebrows shot up like he was surprised Dad wasn't in the mood for chit-chat. You have a real knack for picking your days off, he said with a short laugh. We had a little issue with the pipes this afternoon, he turned to Owen. Hope you don't get seasick, because you practically need a boat to get around down there. We've got it sorted out now, the plumber said, scanning his clipboard. It'll be just fine. Sam nodded. Yup, he said. He's got it sorted out now. But what I'd like to know is why he found the valve still loose on the pump. Owen had been standing there listening with clenched fists, but now his heart plummeted. He cast a wild glance in his dad's direction and saw that his face had drained of color, but he didn't move a muscle. He stood entirely still, his eyes fixed on Sam. I guess I must not have tightened it up enough, he said, his words slow and measured. Well, somebody sure didn't, the plumber chimed in, looking up. That wasn't real smart. No, it wasn't, Sam said. Not real cheap, either. The plumber shook his head and gave a low whistle. Owen stepped forward. Listen, he said, but Dad held up his hand, and he was pulled up short, falling abruptly silent. It's my fault, Dad said to Sam, who bobbed his head. You bet it is, he agreed, the false smile wiped from his face. And look. I know your family, and I know you're going through a rough patch here, but I can't have this kind of sloppy work in one of my buildings, especially not after what happened the other day. Dad said nothing, but he kept his back very straight as he listened. I don't feel good about this, Patrick, Sam was saying. I don't feel good about it at all, but I've got to find someone I can rely on. I understand, Dad said, his voice tight. Sam rubbed at the back of his neck his eyes cutting over to Owen. You can take your time getting out of the apartment, okay? Take all the time you need. That's good of you, Dad said, but we'll be out by the end of the week. Okay, Sam said. Okay, Dad said. Okay, the plumber said, tearing off a bill and handing it over to Sam. Owen was still staring dumbly at the scene before him, but when Dad began to cross the lobby, heading for the basement door, he snapped back, hurrying after him. Dad said nothing as they walked down the stairs, nothing as they led them as he led them through the concrete hallways, ducking his head below the pipes that ran across the ceiling like a maze. It wasn't until they were inside the apartment with the door closed behind him that he let out a long breath, his shoulders slumping. He leaned against the wall, the same place where he'd been huddled when he'd come back from Coney Island the other night, visibly shaken. Owen was the first to speak. It's my fault, he said. I was the one who didn't close the valve all the way. Dad smiled wearily. I was the one who should have reminded you. You were sick. Doesn't matter, he said. You couldn't possibly know how to do something like that. It was my job and my responsibility, so it's my fault. Yeah, but... Hey, he said, looking up sharply. It's fine. We're going to be fine. Owen said nothing, only watched as Dad pushed himself off the wall, walking over to the kitchen where he opened one of the drawers and pulled out the box of cigarettes. He held it for a moment, just looking at it, then opened the lid with great care. But when he saw there was only one left, he set it gently back in the drawer. He glanced over at Owen, who was hovering in the doorway, and his face was entirely expressionless. I'm going to lie down for a bit, he said. We'll figure it out later, okay? Wake me when you're ready for dinner. Owen nodded, then retreated back down the hallway to his own room, where he sifted through an overgrown pile of laundry, fishing out the pair of shorts he'd been wearing a week ago, the day the lights had gone out. He reached into one pocket, then the other, then turned each one inside out. But the cigarette, his mother's cigarette, was no longer there. Sitting on the edge of the bed, he felt a great weariness wash over him, and rather than fight it, he let it carry him out to sea. He curled up and closed his eyes, and he knew then that he wouldn't wake his father later, that he'd let him sleep, and that he'd sleep too. And with any luck, tomorrow would be better. In the morning, when the column of sun reached in through his tiny window, he hauled himself out of bed and back down the hallway where he found his dad bent over a map at the kitchen counter. It was faded and curling at the corners, and there were small rips along the seams. 
How old is that thing? Owen asked, stifling a yawn. Older than you, Dad said, without looking up. He was tracing a finger along a thread of highway, and when Owen leaned in, he could see the direction it was moving. West. Was California even a state then, he joked, and Dad shot him a look, but there was something good-natured about it, something almost joyful, and Owen sensed that, there, that some curtain had been lifted since last night, some weight they'd both been carrying. I was thinking we might take a little drive. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he said with a grin. I was thinking we'd head out west on the road, see how far we get. Oh, we read that wrong, sorry. I was thinking we'd head out on the road, see how far we get. Owen tried to hide his smile, but failed completely. That sounds like a pretty good plan. You'd be fine with it then, Dad asked, not saying here, not staying here, not going back. Yes, he said with a decisive nod, and the word echoed through his head. Yes, yes, yes. His chest felt light and expansive, his heart lifting at the thought and it seemed so sensible, so obvious, that they would go west, that they would move forward because where else was there to go? That it almost felt like a trick, like at any moment, dad might tell him it was all some terrible joke, but he didn't. Instead, he folded up the map, giving Owen a searching look. You'd be missing some school. I'll survive, Owen said, nodding at the map. You can use the thing to teach me geography. Seriously, he said. I don't want you falling behind because of this. I have enough credits to graduate now if I wanted to, Owen said, and I can do my applications on the road. It won't be a problem, really. Dad smiled, but it didn't make it all the way up to his eyes, which remained solemn. So we're doing this. Owen nodded. We're doing this. Okay, Dad said, and he lifted his coffee mug, nudging another toward Owen. They raised them at the same time, the clink of the ceramic ringing out through the drab kitchen and along the halls of the little apartment. Owen floated through the school day in a haze, daydreaming about the road ahead of them. They could end up in Chicago or Colorado or California. It didn't matter. It would be a new start, not in the dungeon of some great city castle, but out west where there were more mountains than people and where the skies were lousy with stars. After school, he walked home with his head still buzzing, his thoughts several time zones away. He crossed the lobby and hurried through the mailroom, eager to get downstairs and see what other plans his dad might have come up with while he was at school, pausing only to unlock the little cubby that belonged to the basement apartment. He threw the two catalogs and the envelope full of coupons directly into the bin and was just about to slam the door when he noticed something in the back. Even before he reached for it, he knew what it was. He had no idea where it was from or what it would say, but he knew it was from her. He just knew. The scene on the front was an overhead view of the city of London, and he stared at it, stunned that she could be an ocean away from him without him even knowing. He was still puzzled over this. He was still puzzling over this as he flipped it over and his heart began to beat quick as a hummingbird. There on the, pack of the, on the back of the postcard were the exact same words he'd written just yesterday. I actually do. He blinked at it, stunned, and he felt his mouth stretch into a slow smile. She'd sent him a postcard too, and with the very same message he'd sent her. It seemed impossible, yet here it was. And as he stood there gaping at it, his mouth hanging open, he sent someone in the doorway. It's because of what it says on the front, she said, and it took Owen a moment to wrench his eyes from the message in his hand. When he finally looked up, there she was, leaning on the handle of her suitcase, her cheeks flushed and her eyes bright. The whole wish you were here thing, she shook her head and a few strands came loose from her ponytail. It's stupid. I didn't expect, I didn't think I'd be here when you got it. No, he said, holding it up like an idiot. It's great, really. Thank you. I'm just getting back, actually, she said, pointing at the bag. My parents flew me over there a few days after the blackout. I looked for you, he said, then shook his head, wishing he could think of something better to say, wishing his mind would keep up with his heart, which was thundering in his chest. I guess that's why, she nodded. Guess so. Listen, I'm sorry about the roof that day, he said in a rush. I was coming back, but then... 
No, it's fine, she said. I wasn't expecting. It was just that my dad... It's okay, she said, as the words crossed like swords in the air between them. Owen glanced down at the postcard, the small blocky letters on the back. Then he flipped it over again, and the words were t went tumbling around in his head. Wish you were here. He had, and he did, and now he was leaving. He raised his eyes to meet hers, pulling in a breath. There's actually something, he began, but once again, she had started to speak as well. I need to tell you something, she was saying, and he nodded, her mouth twisted to one side. I think, she said, then paused and began again. I think we're probably moving. Owen stared at her. You are? It's still not completely for sure, but it looks that way, yeah. Where? To London, actually. My parents are still over there working out the details. Wow, he said, shaking his head back and forth. That's, wow. I know, she said. It's crazy and really fast. How fast? Next month, probably, she said. And he must have looked surprised because she hurried on. But we'd be keeping the apartment here, and my dad promised we could still come back for the summer, or at least some of it. So maybe, Owen forced a smile. Yeah, he said, maybe. Lucy sighed. I'm still not sure about how I feel. I'm still not sure how I feel about all this. He nodded numbly. He wasn't sure why this news should be hitting him so hard, why he should feel, why he should be feeling left behind when he was leaving too. Well, he said, it's a lot closer to Paris and Rome and Prague, she grinned. So you're saying I shouldn't play the sell a new girl card? Not at all, he said, twisting the postcard around in his hand like a pinwheel. You can complain to me any time you want. I might just take you up on that, she said, and he took a deep breath, trying to work up to his own news to explain that he would be leaving too, that they'd been brought together again only to go pinballing off in opposite directions. But he couldn't find the words, and so instead they just stood there, regarding each other silently, the room suddenly as quiet as the elevator had been, as comfortable as the kitchen floor, as remote as the roof. Because that's what happened when you were with someone like that. The world shrank to just the right size. It molded itself to fit only the two of you and nothing more. Eventually, a woman with a baby on her hip inched her way around Lucy's suitcase, scraping her key against the lock of her mailbox and they stepped aside to give her room. When she left, the spell had been broken. So, Lucy said, turning her suitcase around so that it was facing the other direction. I should probably go unpack. She nodded at the postcard he was still clutching. I know it's kind of cheesy. No, it's great, Owen said, and a laugh escaped him. Actually, you should keep an eye on your mailbox, too. She tilted her head, eyeing him like she didn't quite believe it. Really? Really. Okay, then, she said with a smile. He nodded. Okay, then. He watched as she wheeled the suitcase back through the lobby and over to the elevators, the place where they'd first met. As soon as she punched the button, the door opened with a bright ding. But just as she was about to step inside, he called out to her. Lucy, he said, and she rolled around, looking at him unexpectedly. Behind her, the doors eased shut again, and he jogged over with no plan at all, no words in mind, no brilliant speech no idea at all what he might possibly say next. But something urgent had bubbled up inside him at the sight of her walking away, something desperate and true. If you're about to suggest the stairs instead, she said, teasing him, but he only shook his head. I was just gonna say, he trailed off, looking at her helplessly. He wanted to tell her that he was leaving too, even sooner than she was, and that this might be goodbye. He wanted to say, Let's keep in touch, or hope we'll see each other again, or I'll miss you. But none of it seemed quite right. Instead, he just stood there, tongue-tied and faltering, unable to say anything at all. But it didn't matter. After a moment, she leaned forward and put a hand on his shoulder. And then to his surprise, she rose onto her tiptoes and kissed him. His eyes widened as their lips met and the nearness of her made the world go blurry until all at once it wasn't. 
All at once it came into focus again, and the clearest thing of all, the truest thing of all, was the girl right in front of him. And so he closed his eyes and kissed her back. Too soon she broke away, and when she stepped back again, he could see that she was smiling. Don't worry, she said, just before stepping into the open elevator. I'll send you a postcard. And that's the end of chapter eight. Thanks for watching.